Action, How Movies Begin by Megan McCarthy. Read by Mrs. Cook, IDS at Hoffman Trails Elementary School. Action, How Movies Begin by Megan McCarthy. Movies, they take us on adventures, send us back in time and introduce us to new people and places. They allow us to peek inside the life of the 16th century's Queen of England or step into the colorful excitement of the 1970s disco craze. They can spark joy, sadness, and even fear. We can't imagine our world without them. When did movies start? Who invented them? Elizabeth, The Golden Age, 2007. The evolution of the moving picture is a long journey with many people adding a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Throughout most of the 1800s, photography required considerably longer exposure times. Therefore, a freeze frame photo of motion wasn't possible. Art such as this painting was the only way people could imagine a horse running while frozen in time. The question is, did the artist get it right? Leland Stanford, a wealthy horse owner and once governor of California, didn't think so. This painting is based on a detail from the painting The Hunt and Belvoir Vale by John Fernley Sr. and Sir Francis Grant. Copyright 1835. Even though by the 1870s, camera exposure times had shortened, the question of what a horse's running gait looked like had not been answered. Stanford asked Award Moybridge, who was a well-known nature photographer, to help him solve the mystery. How would a man who photographed stationary scenes such as this valley document something moving? Moybridge came up with a clever solution. Moybridge set up a row of cameras with threads that stretched across a track. When the horse broke the threads, snap, 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 the cameras recorded a series of photos. This is one example. Does the horse look the same as the one in the painting? This is The Horse in Motion, 1878. Moybridge's Photographs were inspired by the motion experiments of a French scientist named Etienne Jules Maury. The two men met while Moybridge was touring Paris in 1881. Maury wished to record birds in flight, but Moybridge's technique didn't seem to work well with birds. Therefore, in 1882, Maury invented a handheld camera to better record motion. The photographer had to pull the trigger in quick succession to get results. These are a few of Mahri's photographic studies. Thomas Edison, the famous inventor, met with both Moybridge and Mahri. Edison knew he could make a better invention than theirs. One of Edison's advantages was that he had a team of employees working for him. He assigned the project to inventor and photographer William Kennedy Dixon. After much work, Dixon came up with something called a kinetograph, used to record motion, and a kinetoscope, used to play back this motion. The motion was recorded on something called celluloid film. That's why movies are sometimes called films today. By 1893, the inventions were completed. Below is what the inside of a kinetoscope looks like. You can visit a kinetoscope in a museum today. The one shown here is in West Orange, New Jersey at Thomas Edison National Historical Park. The kinetograph was quite heavy, so it couldn't be transported outside. Therefore, Edison's team erected a building in which to use the new invention. When the men turned the crank, the roof opened. When they pushed the building around the circular track, the roof and sun aligned, allowing sunlight to pour in and light up their film's subjects. This is the Black Maria 
named after a police wagon in 1893. Inside the Black Maria, Edison and his team created something magical. They created motion pictures. One year later, the first kinetoscope parlors opened. Inside these parlors, curious viewers peered into wooden boxes and watched slices of life animated for the first time. This is what they saw. Carmencita, 1894, approximately 21 seconds long. Fred Ott's Sneeze, 1894, approximately five seconds long. The Boxing Cats, Professor Welton's, 1894, approximately 20 seconds long. Brothers Augusta and Louis Lumiere, whose family owns a large photography supply company in France, set out to invent a cheaper and lighter film camera. The Lumieres thought watching films should be a group experience. So in addition to the camera, they invented a projector to share their films with the world. Their first public screening was in 1895. We stared flabbergasted at this sight, stupefied and surprised beyond all expression, said a magician in the audience by the name of Georges Valise. At the end of the show, there was complete chaos. Everyone wondered how such a result was obtained. Here are some of the films shown that year. They are called the French word, actualités. They are something real, a slice of life. Cinema was born. Arrival of a train at La Ciotat. Fishing for goldfish. Baby's meal. The blacksmiths. Back in the United States, Edison Manufacturing Company created one of the first hand-tinted films in 1895. It plays with movement and color. Here is Annabelle Serpentine Dance, 1895. The Lumiere brothers tried this technique for themselves. This is the Serpentine Dance, 1897. After viewing the Lumiere brothers' films, Georges Malise could not resist buying his own film camera. It wasn't long before the magician figured out how to do magic tricks using the camera. In this two minute film, he plays every role himself. What magic! Malise's most famous film is called A Trip to the Moon. By stopping the camera, placing a rocket ship in the moon's eye, and then restarting the recording, pop! A rocket ship appears to land with a splat. Malise created a color version using the hand painting techniques that Edison and the Lumieres utilized. As time went on, films got better, but something was missing, sound. Although this filmmaking time period was called the silent era, it was hardly science. A pianist or even an orchestra would accompany the soundless films. Since the movies were silent, cards with hand letter type were cut into scenes to communicate the dialogue. They look like this. I'm Emma Jane Perkins and we've got seven cows. The year was 1913. We need some gags here, said a director to a young English-born Charlie Chaplin. Put on comedy makeup, anything will do. Chaplin said of his costume, I wanted everything a contradiction. The pants baggy, the coat tight, the hat small, and the shoes large. And just like that, one of the most memorable characters of the silent era was born. Another actor named Buster Keaton was called a stone-faced comedian. Whatever happened around him, his expression never changed. The more seriously I took my work, he once said, the better laughs I got. Keaton's acrobatic skills and risk-taking make for jaw-dropping viewing even to this day. There were no special effects in the 1920s. In this scene, Keaton did the stunt himself. No wires attached. He missed the building and fell into a net off screen, badly bruising himself in the process. Even today, 
Some actors do their own stunts. Although Tom Cruise was attached to a wire, he missed the building and broke his ankle. Cruise and Keaton both illustrate a daring quality that makes them riveting to watch. Here you can see how one iconic movie scene inspired others. Harold Lloyd and Safety Last, 1923. Hugo, 2011. Back to the Future, 1985. In this scene, comedian Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle sticks forks into two dinner rolls and makes them dance in The Rough House, 1917. Chaplin does the same thing in The Gold Rush, 1925. Watch Johnny Depp do his excellent rendition in Benny and Joan in 1993. In the United States, during what was called the Roaring Twenties, prejudice was quite apparent. People of color were rarely included in mainstream movies. An African-American actress by the name of Josephine Baker decided she'd had enough. She packed up her things and moved to France. I felt liberated in Paris, she said. There she became a star. Actresses like Baker, with her beauty, humor, and large stage presence, paved the way for the stars of today. In 2018, a Marvel movie titled Black Panther, with a majority black cast, was a smash hit. This is something Baker could have only dreamed of. In 1925, the year that Josephine Baker moved to Paris, The Phantom of the Opera was released. During this time period, it was popular to use dyes to color parts of the films. The Phantom of the Opera effectively uses colors to create moody atmospheres using pinks, yellows, greens, and blues. Americans weren't the only ones creating innovative films. The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari is thought to be the first full-length German horror film, released in 1920. It plays with light and shadow and lines. The world is angular, topsy-turvy, and jarring. The makeup is heavy and spooky. Shadows were hand-painted for dramatic effect. In this scene, all you can see is a person's shadow. How does it make you feel? Nosferatu, also created in Germany, is an early adaptation of the book Dracula. You can see how the cabinet of Dr. Caligari was an inspiration. Nosferatu illustrates stop motion techniques used earlier by filmmakers such as Georges Malise for scenes in which doors open and close on their own, haunting. Just the shadow of the vampire causes shivers. Nosferatu, 1922. One of the earliest science fiction films that is still appreciated to this day is Metropolis. This futuristic German film remains relevant. In it, society's wealthy travel in flying vehicles and enjoy lavish garden parties while the low-paid workers suffer in a steam-filled underworld containing giant machines that must stay running 24-7. Some film critics loved it. Others hated it. Regardless of the criticism, Metropolis's innovative sets and costumes are a feast for the eyes. Metropolis, 1927. The robot on the left is named C-3PO. Does he look familiar? Star Wars, 1977. This painting is inspired by Metropolis, 1927. The painting is similarly inspired by Blade Runner, 1982. Do you see the similarity? One year after Metropolis was released, an all-talky movie called Lights of New York hit theaters. 
No one had watched a movie like this before. Imagine hearing your favorite actor speak for the first time. Imagine hearing city sounds for the first time. Traffic, a crowd of people, the dings of a trolley car. What would you think? The sound and lights of New York wasn't perfect, but people wanted more. Movie lovers began using the word talkies, short for talking movies, as in, I'm going to a talkie today. One would think that all movies after Lights of New York would have sound, but that isn't so. Charlie Chaplin's last silent film opened in 1936, eight years after the first all-talking film had been released. Almost a century later, the movie Lion, which takes place in India, was released. In it, you hear a train horn, hordes of people chattering and rushing this way and that, eerie chimes and unintelligible announcements echoing through a concrete space. The sounds help illustrate the confusion and fear that Saru, a young boy who was lost and wants to go home, is feeling. One movie inspires another, which inspires another. Next time you watch a movie, think of all the people who tried something new and pushed the boundaries of what is possible. Movies will continue to inspire us for generations to come. And we all have the inventors, actors, writers, and directors to thank. Author's note, this book is not an extensive history of cinema's silent era. Instead, it is meant to be a jumping off point to get readers excited to learn more and hopefully do their own research by sampling old movies. Although this book is for children, I'm sure film buffs will wonder why I didn't include their favorite movies or genres. Due to the page count limitation and children's attention spans, my scope had to be very limited. Below are a few more interesting topics to dive into. Please visit my website for much more content on the silent movie era. Megan McCarthy